but thank you very much for the kind words. It's uh, always a pleasure to be with my Denver friends, even though uh, this is not quite the usual gathering. Uh, I think most of you are aware that I practiced obstetrics and gynecology for almost 50 years, but it was only long after I retired that the thought crossed my mind that what would it be like if the human female was genetically programmed the same as our pet cats and dogs, and that when they were going to deliver their babies, they sneaked off someplace so that they could deliver in seclusion all alone. Would I have had any career in obstetrics at all? Would we have somehow evolved through civilization to have such? Well, mercifully for me, uh, that is not quite the way the human genome works. And so I'm going to start out with a little uh, sort of crash course in uh, mammalian biology. Now the key things, our genomes shape our behavior, or all animal behavior. And male mammals are all genetically programmed to mate with any ovulating female. Female mammals are programmed to mate with the best available male when they are ovulating. Now we have two mammalian outliers. Mammalian biology or reproduction is remarkably similar, except for these two, the duck-billed platypus on the left and the human female on the right. Now, I'm very fond of the duck-billed platypus. It is really quite intriguing. It lays eggs and incubates them just like a, a hen does. And when the little duck-bills hatch, the mother sees them and it triggers the release of hormones that let her produce milk. She has a little challenge for her babies though because she doesn't have any breasts. Instead, she has all these little uh, like sweat glands that produce milk over her abdomen and the milk sort of percolates out through her fur and little duck bulls have to lap it up. The duck bill also has one other unique characteristic which is inherited from ancient uh, male ancestor, that they are venomous. They're the only mammal that is venomous, and it's only the male who has a little spur on the right hind leg, which produces a venom very similar to that of the cobra. And they call it a spur, but it's actually a fang because there's up in the leg, there's a gland that produces the venom, then there's a little injecting mechanism here, and the, the spur is hollow like a fang, and so that injects it through. And you can see what the fang looks like when it is brought out. It can be sheathed otherwise. Now, the human female has some unique characteristics too. The human is the only mammal who has enlarged breasts when they're not lactating. She also is the only mammal who can see her partner's face while mating. And that can have a lot to do with uh, personal relationships, as you might imagine. Also, the only mammal that has this characteristic that otherwise is shared with serpents, and that is to have a hymen. For the snake that's slithering through the sand, it's a very useful thing. Uh, I think. Uh, for the human, we could just as well do without it. But the most important thing is that we are the only mammal that has concealed ovulation. Now that is critically important in, in influencing human behavior because since the woman never knows when she is ovulating, she has to be having intercourse at any time in order to have a pregnancy which means she is compelled to make herself sexually attractive at all times. And no other mammal has that burden. So now it gets into uh, ancient Egypt and how did the ancient women cope with this challenge? Well, they had a number of little beauty tricks that they used. First, as far as I have been able to determine, they are the originators of lipstick. 
they also invented eye makeup, which is very important, and rouge, and these things have carried down to the current day. They use perfume, which probably was used in many other societies. But here you see women who have gathered lotus flowers here, bringing a basket and putting them into a press, which they squeeze the, uh, the cloth to crush the blossoms and the juice goes through the funnel and into the pot where it is gathered. Then when they had one of their banquets, for instance, or and also for home use, they would use a little of this perfume to uh, enhance their attractiveness. They also apparently used perfumed cones of beeswax like this, which would melt in the heat and apparently make them more attractive, although it seems to be unappealing, frankly. They were also very strong for cleanliness. It was the custom to bathe daily and both men and women shaved all body hair using uh, tempered copper uh, razors such as this. And one of the woman's most important possessions was to have a mirror so that she was getting all of her makeup right. In addition, they learned to use jewelry to both enhance their attractiveness and also for the amulytic protection that they had. Uh, this is a um, actually a girdle that was wrapped around the, the hips. And these are called wallet beads. It's a hollow gold cowrie the shell mimics. And inside it is a little bead so that when the woman walked, if she gave a little extra action with her hips, the bead would roll around inside it and make a little squishing sound, which would uh, draw attention to her and, uh, and her wiggling hips. Amulets were also protective, and the most important one for the woman was the cowrie, because of its resemblance to the vulva, and it was a protection against all female disorders. And we do have good evidence that they had human papillomavirus, which causes cervical cancer, they had chlamydia, which they saw as trachoma affecting the eyes, but it also caused pelvic inflammatory disease and infertility, though the ancient Egyptians didn't recognize it as such. They also had herpes, which is an equal opportunity uh, STD, the first to affect women disproportionately, but herpes is uh, much more democratic. And they topped it all off with wigs, which were a great time saver because you could have a very elaborate hairdo and pop on the wig and you're ready to go in a flash. They also used old, very productive clothing, such as a net dress like this, and there are two of them known. And overall, they were masters at the art of both concealing and revealing to be attractive to their partners or would-be partners. They made linen, which was semi-transparent, which was almost a forerunner of modern lingerie. Now, this is an encapsulation of a female's life in ancient Egypt. She was born, went through childhood, menarche, which is the, the onset of the first period, occurred probably around age 14 to 15. Following that, unless they were part of royalty where there were formal marriages, they went into a cohabitation status, which was the equivalent of marriage, but without all the legal fault or all that we go through. Following this, of course, they would have copulation, which led to pregnancy, which led to lactation, and then it was pregnancy, lactation, pregnancy, lactation, until they either died or hit menopause. Now, death was unfortunately very common in uh, ancient Egypt and, in fact, throughout the world until the last century or so, with a maternal mortality in the order of 1.5 to 2%. Now, if you get pregnant in Denver or Los Angeles today, 
the maternal mortality is one one hundredth of one percent, one in 10,000. So we don't think that of pregnancy as being such a challenge, but it was a very dangerous thing through most of the world for human history until uh, the advent of obstetrics in the 19th century. Now the infant mortality and child mortality was as bad as the maternal mortality. The evidence is good that about a third of babies died in the first year for multiple causes, and most of them in the first couple months. And 50% of all the babies would be dead before they became five years old. After that, it was much better. 53% were gone by 10 years, even though 50% were gone in five. And by the time they hit 15, which was reproductive age, 55% of the females were gone. This is good, good data uh, from based on studies from Rome and Egypt in the first century. And it is echoed by the first modern studies, which were done in Scotland uh, during the 19th century. And then they're matched by the data that comes out of sub-Saharan Africa in the last 20 years. In the absence of good obstetrical care, this is what happens. Now, I want to discuss a birthing paradox using these five animals. These are the only ones known to one company when giving birth. The whale, of course, lives in the ocean, but has to breathe air. And it is imperative that the newborn get to the surface to breathe. And if there are twins, this can be a real challenge. So when a whale is giving birth, a sister whale is right beside her and assists her to be sure that the newborn, whether it's one or two, get to the surface to breathe. That is a critical benefit. The bat has a challenge that's somewhat similar. She must give birth hanging from the top of the cave or barn. And if her baby drops to the floor, then it's gone. So the bats are genetically programmed that all the female bats clutter together at the same spot in the cave called the nursery. And when she gives birth, the sister bats or relative bats on either side of her use their wings to assist her to make sure that her baby doesn't fall. And remarkably enough, a bat can tuck a baby bat into her wing pit or armpit and actually fly holding it to go out and feed. A healthy female adult elephant fears no predator, but she is vulnerable when giving birth, as is her newborn. So a sister elephant stays beside her during that time and will befall any predator that might try to attack her. The marmoset has an interesting challenge because these little monkeys that live in the rainforest of Brazil typically have triplets. And so they can hang on with their tails to anchor themselves and deal with two of them pretty easily. But the third is a challenge, and it is the same problem if it falls to the floor in the, in the forest, it's gone. So a sister of Marmoset stays with her and assists to be sure that the third one doesn't fall. Now, the human female is sort of interesting because. The other four all have some critically, desperately needed action that is provided. But what is done by the woman who accompanies the human female? All she can offer is some help against very minor predators, some nourishment, water, and encouragement. But apparently over thousands of generations, that is enough to make a big difference to really entrench that behavior. Now, I like to use Queen Elizabeth because she is one of the unsung heroines of modern obstetrics. She had eight children, which of course was typical for women, 
of every culture right up to that time. And on her fifth pregnancy, she had chloroform anesthesia. At the time, the Catholic priests and Protestant ministers, and Anglican ministers too, all preached that a woman was supposed to suffer in childbirth because of Eve eating that apple. And it was really immoral to provide relief for pain in childbirth. But Queen Elizabeth, uh, uh, Queen Victoria rather, said to hell with that. She liked the anesthesia for the fifth so well that she had it for her sixth, seventh, and eighth. And as head of the Church of England, she legitimized it for the entire British Empire. And very rapidly, it was decided that the women, one of who are Catholic, were going to have the same benefit. So she is one of my heroines. But at any rate, that gets back to ancient Egypt and a paradox of pregnancy. There is no pragmatic medical maternity care that was known in ancient Egypt. There's no word for a midwife or doula or obstetrician. It was too dangerous for the Sunu, the Egyptian physicians, to get tangled up with it. So it was all in the domain of magic. Now, the interesting paradoxical thing is that the priests of Sekhmet, and I lost a T off that, I don't know where it went. Uh, sorry about that. But the priests of Sekhmet were known to, quote, no cattle, and they were probably the first veterinarians. And we see an example here of the veterinarian assisting in the birth of a calf. And we have a number of depictions, uh, particularly in Old Kingdom tombs, of cattle giving birth, and they're being assisted by someone who I will call a veterinarian or preliminary one. And this one is a normal, typical head-first delivery. But other depictions, and I'm sorry I don't have them to show you, show abnormal deliveries where just a rear leg is coming out or the butt is coming out, a breech delivery, and it shows them manipulating to provide a safe birth. So the priests of Sekhmet clearly understood the mechanisms of birth of cattle and knew how to manipulate to make it successful. There is no such understanding of the mechanism of human birth. Now, their conception of pregnancy was rather naive. They felt that the woman was just a carrier of the fetus, that the male planted a seed, and it grew. During pregnancy, the god who took care of the woman was Tawaret. She was the protector of pregnant women, a pregnant hippopotamus with pendulous female human breasts, claws of a lion, and a crocodile draws teeth and a crocodile tail down her back. When it came to the actual, the fetus, he was, or she, as the case might be, was protected by Bess, who was a little bandy-legged dwarf with this sort of lionine mane and usually wore a ostrich feather crown. And he also looked after the babies and children. Later on, he was protected, he was uh, joined by a female, Bessette, who also wore the same wig, but otherwise was a normal human, a counterplastic dwarf, usually with a, a normal human face and not the, not the fierce one of Bess, but carrying his shield or other accoutrements. For the actual birthing process, the goddess in charge was Meshkenet, otherwise the goddess of the birth bricks. And she is portrayed as a birth brick with the goddess symbol on it, and sometimes in a more stylized fashion with her name spelled out. She is also shown as a human female, and many of the goddesses are shown just as a, as a typical human with the headdress indicating what goddess she is. To the right here, we have a Pesesh Kef, 
which is a fishtail knife, uh, which goes back to pre-dynastic time. The sharp part of it is here, and it was used to cut the umbilical cord. It was the original first special purpose surgical instrument. And it later became stylized into this shape, which we see in, in later periods. Now they gave birth in a birth bower or a special room in their house. Uh, sometimes it could be set up outside or uh, as in Dira Medina, it was in a special raised room in the front, which was decorated with magical images of best and also with special vine, which we see here, which I'll talk about a little bit later. But they were always accompanied, and usually they would have a sister or a mother or a very close friend. And I suspect when a pregnancy was difficult, they may well have called in a woman who had uh, successfully had 10 or 12 or more babies from their community because she would have been obviously blessed by the gods to have been so successful. And so these people were actually the equivalent of what we call today a doula, some who just gave encouragement as well as some nourishment. Now the term for being in labor was to be on the bricks. They gave birth in a squatting position and the cow-headed goddesses seen here are uh, reflections of the goddess Hathor, goddess of love, and she was uh, critical for the whole process. The hieroglyph for birth is an adaptation of the woman we see here on the right with uh, the squatting position and the baby with its extended arms is coming out and this is the actual glyph representing the same thing in a more stylized fashion. Only one actual birth brick has ever been found, and that was in the village middle, from the Middle Kingdom at Abydos, which the University of Pennsylvania found. And there was enough decoration on that that it could be reconstructed as we see it here. And it was in the chambers of the daughter of the mayor of the village. And she had the cow-headed standards on each side and her attendants. And she has obviously given birth to a male because of the dark coloring of the, of the baby. They also used further magic with these wands, which were made from hippo tusks and many of them show wear at this end, and they're carved with the apotraic figures, and sometimes even with the name of the, of the owner. And it's believed that they were used to draw a magic circle around the woman who was delivering, which would keep anything evil from crossing into it. And after birth, the baby would be placed on the brick and a similar protective circle drawn around. Now, this was Dr. Wegner's a uh, suggestion of how the bricks were used, that the woman stood on it, and her doula-type accompaniments would stabilize her. Uh, I delivered thousands of babies, but only a handful in the squatting position. But I think that would be very difficult to sustain. So I, I question that that's actually the way they were used. Another suggestion is that they sort of kneeled on them, and this would be much more stable. But I think the most likely thing would be, and I don't have a picture of it, is that the bricks would be placed at right angles so that the woman could have a buttock and a thigh on each, which would leave her open and very stable so that her assistants could also hold her hands to further stabilize her. And I think that would be a much more practical way for it to be done. But we don't really know. There's only one good depiction of a birth, which is known, and that was from the birth of Cleopatra in the Temple of Armand. Unfortunately, that uh, temple was uh, dismantled in the uh, 18th century to make a sugarcane factory. And this block, 
which was copied by Napoleon savants, was carried off and has not been seen again. Now, Tawirat was um, used to enhance the magic to help the mother. And this is a magical vessel where you can see the opening at the top and it was hollow so that fluid could be poured in and it would come out through the goddess's breast so that the pregnant woman could then drink it, sort of, sort of turned it into holy water and it would bring the power of the goddess to help her. Uh, apparently, the Egyptian women didn't like having stretch marks any more than modern women did. And it's believed that these objects, called gravitin flasha, which date to the Middle Kingdom, uh, were used to contain an ointment that was used to massage the abdomen to relieve the development of stretch marks. Now, there were some practical help, but it was magical and it was from magicians. This is from a shaft tomb from the uh, Ramesseum and it is now in the Manchester Museum and I hope you can see it well. It is a obviously human female wearing a Besset mask. Here's another one actually from Cahoon from the Middle Kingdom. The Ramesside one obviously was much later. But when from that same Ramesside tomb, they found an actual mask that was used by the magician who owned that tomb. And it was painted, and Petrie saw that it had been repainted several times, and also the eye, the right eye of the mask had been enlarged. So this was clearly used. The magician had obviously gone to assist with difficult births to make them safer. And this is the actual mask now as it exists in the uh, Manchester Museum. Unfortunately, quite deteriorated. But that's the only such known. Now, there probably were similar magicians who used Tawarat masks because we have an example here of a model just like we had of the, of the best Besset mask of a human female who is wearing the Tawaret mask. This one is from uh, Middle Kingdom near Obasra, Persia rather. And here is another one from Lish, which was um, excavated uh, by the Metropolitan Museum. So, no Tawaric mask has been found, but I wouldn't be surprised if they didn't exist, just as the Besset one. Now, again, in the magical birth bower, they may have had some additional practical help. Uh, nobody knows quite what this decoration is that we see around these bowers, but it could be, it's so stylized, it could be a dozen different plants. But my proposal for it is that it could be a plant that grew out in Egypt called Aristolochia, which means excellent birth in, in Greek. And it is a biologic drug which causes uterine contractions, which would be very useful, uh, particularly to prevent excessive bleeding. And we see here the woman who has just given birth is being shown a mirror to show how good she looks after going through the ordeal, but she's also being offered a little vial of something, and it must be something medicinal and restorative, and it wouldn't surprise me if it wasn't Aristolochia, which would make sense, because that, that's been used, we know, documented from, parliamentary, from Ptolemaic times right up to modern herbal medicines to this day. Now, the real result of all this was that most women spent the, most of their adult lives either pregnant or lactating. And there's a little paradox with the lactation too. We have lots of scenes of royal kings uh, being nursed by goddesses. 
And we had a goddess, for, of course, for lactation, and that was Renenutet. She was a cobra-headed goddess who wore this special crown, and sometimes she was a human female with this head, and uh, often she was just the servant and identified by her name. But she was also not only lactation, but she was a goddess of the harvest, and you might call her a goddess of nutrition, but she was particularly important so that the woman could produce milk. Now, it was the standard at the time to breastfeed for about three years, and we know that from two contracts for wet nurses, as well as from various literature which, which talks about it. And in this particular contact, the nurse was, wet nurse was hired for three years. She would be provided room and board and be given oil and silver, but it would be refunded if her milk failed or if she became ill. To the left here, we see you have uh, Maya, who was the wet nurse for King Tut, with King Tut sitting on her lap. And several places in her tomb in Saqqara, it makes it, she makes it very clear that she was the wet nurse for King Tut, and her breast is exposed, but not in any scene is she shown actually nursing. And I know of no tomb anywhere which shows the owner of the tomb being pregnant or nursing. A lot of the women also decided they'd had enough babies and wished that they could have contraception. They had no really effective contraception. The thing that spaced pregnancies was actually lactation. That was the most effective birth control that they had at the time. Now again, they may have used Taweret magical vessel during the later part uh, and, and to assist with, uh, with lactation. As I, as I mentioned, this paradox that no tombs uh, show uh, any lactation. There are only five tombs that are known to show a pregnant woman at all. And this is the tomb of Ankh-Mahor at Mahar Sakara. And we have one pregnant woman here and another who has fainted as a mourner. So there is no place in the tombs for pregnancy or lactation. Now, a woman's role was clearly to mate and make babies, just in order to have a stable population because of the fierce mortality rate that they had. The average woman had to have seven babies just to have a stable population. And that is actually through for every society right up until about the 19th century, or at least the 18th century. So of course she had to get pregnant in the first place, so we had a goddess for that too. The goddess Hecate, who was a frog, and sometimes shown as a human female with a frog head. Now the woman's life as a child was interesting. That there was little distinction being made between the boys and the girls. They played together and they were naked. There's no sense of modesty in the sense that we have it today. The children tended to mimic their adults. They went with them with whatever their work was. There was very limited mobility upward in ancient Egypt during stable times, which was most of the time. And if you were born into a baker's family, you became a baker. Same thing if you were a farmer, a fisher, or whatever else. So the children would go along with the adults, and typically the adults would be clothed, but the child would be naked. And that was equally true for the girls. If a uh, mother was a Kenner dancer or a chantress of the moon or a musician, the child would go along with her and learn the trade as she grew up. If you were born in a scribal family, then you, of course you went to scribal school and learn to read and write, but that was a very small percentage and very rare for women, but there were a few. The transition from a child to an adult was very rapid. Metarchy probably occurred around age to 14, 
And that was typical throughout the world until the last uh, couple centuries or even a century and a half. And we can see here that this girl is clearly pubertal. Uh, she is going to have a period within the next six months. And when she does, she will abandon her child's hairdo and she will shave her body hair and she will dress as an adult. And even though she is shown in a family scene like this one where Mena is hunting while his family gathers lotuses, his two daughters who are teens are dressed fully as adults. One son is dressed wearing a kilt, but one of his sons as, as a child is left naked. Now, once she has uh, become a woman, they didn't, they didn't have teenage years like we do. You went from being a child to an adult, and that was it. It was time to find a mate, and most of the ancient Egyptians, like most people throughout the old world until modern society, married somebody that they grew up with in their community. And they would use magic figure for everything. If they needed it, a Hathor votive could be used with a, a little prayer to get the mate that they wanted. And this is called a mask of Hathor, which is actually a, a, a votive to Hathor, which would be left at a shrine with a prayer of either supplication or thanks. They also could use more compelling magic where a spell would be written on a piece of papyrus and enclosed in clay to make the shape of a, of a human, and it was going to compel the person to love the person who wanted them. And that was Old Kingdom. This is one from the Ptolemaic period, which does the same thing, which is going to compel this woman to only speak of her, the one, the lover who wants her, think of that person, hear of that person, and copulate with that person. Now, much is made of the monotheism and worship of the Aten, um, but even Nefertiti kept these gods who had no priests and no temples, but even at Amarna, they had factories which produced amulets for Taweret and Bess. The women were not going to, even though they embraced the Aten, they were not going to give up these important ones for birth. Now, life expectancy in ancient Egypt for, for women and for men was only until around age 38. And menopause probably occurred a little earlier than 50. It probably occurred in the late, in the late 40s. But you can see it's only in the last 120 years that women could reasonably expect to live past menopause. Menarche also uh, has dropped from about 15 to around 12, but that has just been in the last century. But those who did pass, live past menopause could actually expect to live longer than their contemporary males, but they did suffer from osteoporosis and all the problems that age can bring. And this is the hired lift for an older woman, which is to show her somewhat stooped and leaning on a staff. So finally, it's time for her to be reborn. And rebirth is, echoes her original birth. This is a scene from the Papyrus of Anna, which is the weighing of her heart against the feather of truth, and which hopefully it will balance and she will pass the test. But supervising it, we have Meskenet, the goddess of the birth bricks, helping. And here we have Meskenet again in the human form and her associate, Renanutet, and they both have their names here to make sure we know who they are, who are observing and assisting to make sure that Annie makes it successfully into the afterlife. Now, this is an opening out of the mouth kit on the right. And we see, again, the Pesesh Kef, which was from prehistoric times to cut the cord. 
it got stylized into this instrument, which is Stoa Pesach Kef, which was used for the opening of the mouth ceremony. It was important that this be done in order that the deceased could breathe, speak, and ingest food. And so we hear, see here again, Meshke, Meshkena, with the stylized Pesach Kef on her head, and we can see it here as it was in the opening of the mouth kit. And nobody knows exactly how that ceremony worked, but it was critically important. Some conclusions. Number one is I think the ancient Egyptian women coped with the genomic imperatives as well or even better than women anywhere in the world up until the past century. And I should say in developed countries. Second, the Egyptian women established our concepts of beauty. We went from ancient Egypt to Greece to Rome through the Renaissance to Western civilization. And now thanks to media, they have become the standard for the world because standards which had applied in other cultures, such as particularly in the Orient, where uh, Chinese and Japanese women, the ideal used to be that they be built like a pyramid, a pool cue, very slender and tall with no breasts. That has all changed, and the Western model has been adopted. But it really goes back to our friends in ancient Greece. I mean, ancient Egypt. Most people thought it was Greece, but it's really Egypt. Finally, childbirth and lactation are for life. A woman's tomb is her portal to the happily ever after life and freedom from both pregnancy and lactation. Evidence of both of those are conspicuously absent from all tombs. So thank you for your attention, and I'll uh, take a shot at answering questions. Dr. Herrer, um, one of our attendees asked, wouldn't the royals have had access to superior medical care and less, and have therefore less dire health outcomes? Actually, they wouldn't. There's no evidence of such. They relied on the same magical things. They would have had access to better nutrition, and, uh, but, but there really was no pragmatic care that we know of for them. So the mortality for them would be about the same, sadly. Okay. Um, and then Laura Engel asked, was there any form of birth control? Yes. Um, <clears throat> there, were, there were several prescriptions in the Ebers papyrus. Um, the only one that might actually have been effective, uh, and there were some studies done on it, was to uh, make a tampon with crocodile dung and lint and put that in the vagina. And there actually was studies done that show one crocodile dung that showed that it created a, uh, an environment that was inhospitable to sperm, to quote the paper. Um, but um, otherwise, the, the birth control was more magical than, than actually practical. One of them used gum acacia, which is used in some of the modern, um, well, we're not quite so modern, but earlier contraceptives that were used. Uh, and, and some used salt which would have some effect, but they, they really had no, no good birth control. I was going to say, it sounds like it'd be more inhospitable to most things than just sperm. Uh, yeah, I would think, yeah. <laughs> all right. And then Laura also had another question saying, uh, was there any indication of sex before a stable relationship a situation, like an unwed mother, so to speak? Did they, do we have any evidence of them having a view on the as aspect of virginity at all? Uh, no, apparently that no virginity was no big deal to them. Um, except, of course, at the upper echelons of society, uh, it would be critically important that uh, members of the royal family, uh, if, if they were going to marry off a daughter, it was... Uh, uh, it, it would have 
they would desperately want her to be a virgin, just like uh, the Queen of England would would want and kept Camilla from being the queen right off, or being uh, uh, with with Charles. Uh, but that was that was not a big deal for them. Okay. So Ben, what about the drunken festival? And isn't that kind of a promiscuous gathering? Yes, yes, ver very much. Twice a year at, uh, at the festival, the great festival of the valley, people would come together, uh, particularly at the Temple of Boot and at um, uh, the, the Temple of Bast. They would go with the, the intent of getting drunk to the point of passing out and having a vision of the God. And in the process, they would have intercourse with anybody that they felt with, like at the time, and there was no, no negative connotation they thought of. There was no uh, sense of being um, cheating on a husband or wife. Anybody would have sex with anybody. It was just a, an open orgy, and um, with with the whole idea that you would get drunk and passed out and uh, and see the goddess. Otherwise, uh, I think. Uh, relationship, men and women had the same feelings that they do today, that they expected their mate to be loyal to them. Dr. Herr, how about silphium as a birth control? Is that uh, something that actually worked? Because I know the Romans and the Greeks believed in it. It, it, was, an, it was an herb growing in uh, the area of Libya, and it was actually harvested to extinction because it was considered to be a birth control. Um, yeah, but do you know that it was used in Egypt? Yeah, in the Ptolemaic era. Yes, it was. Yes. Well, no, I'm, I'm familiar with it. I just uh, um, hadn't identified it with, uh, with ancient Egypt. Yeah, I have another question, too. I think uh, you mentioned pregnant women. Hatshepsut's mother is shown as pregnant in Deir el Bakri, which I think is a pretty interesting scene. It's in that immaculate birth uh, scene. That that, that's true, but it's not in a tomb. It's in her mortar, mortuary tomb. True, true, but it's a really yeah. good depiction of a pregnant lady. Yes, yes, it is. Do you have any indication of there, whether there was a differentiation at all between men and women when it came to medical care other than childbirth and pregnancy? Were they treated equally with regard to other medical treatments? Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm unaware of any distinction. I think that's one of the beauties of ancient Egypt is that women were treated with equality uh, to a degree that uh, was largely missing uh, later on. And it, it did decrease as time went on, but um, <clears throat> from the very beginning, uh, women had a status uh, under law uh, that was equal to men. They could own property. They got the children if there was a divorce. There was, um, they had a better uh, legal rights than uh, women through most of the world since. And of course they had women physicians. Peshis Ket was the, uh, the first known female physician. physician. She goes back to uh, the end of the fourth century, I mean, the end of the fourth dynasty. Can you uh, illuminate whether there were any uh, special utensils used for assisting in a difficult childbirth? Obviously, cesarean sections were not invented for quite some time, but there often are complications. You know, there were no instruments were used to assist childbirth until the late 1800s. In fact, the, the, the whole field of obstetrics, no, no attempt to try to do any obstetrical manipulation uh, was prior to about the early 1800s, around the time of Napoleon. Shocking as it seems. The reason I ask is that the uh, tradition is that uh, Julius Caesar had actually been born by a uh, cesarean section of his mother who was apparently having difficulty and rather than just allowing both the uh, infant and the mother to die, 
uh, one of the uh, soldiers who was guarding the party drew out his sword and basically uh, slit the uh, the womb open from the front and that may be anecdotal but it was at least cited in the literature in rome for quite a long time after that yeah that's that that's considered a myth although they did have post-mortem cesareans that where the woman died and an attempt was made to cut the abdomen open to rescue the baby but that almost never works even today. But the, the first documented successful cesarean section was actually done by a Swiss um, goat herd uh, in the 1800s and it, who cut open his wife's abdomen after she had had a long, difficult, impossible labor. And he uh, got so frustrated, he cut her open and actually apparently she survived somehow and that that is pretty well documented but to to just survive a cesarean section up to the time of 1900 was a reportable event it was just you know people just didn't make it through um, now about a third of all deliveries are by cesarean section and it's uh, actually safer to have an elective cesarean section than to attempt vaginal birth. Do they know why the onset of puberty has gone to younger now, the past 100 yes. years or so? For the, the, the same reasons that people are living longer and menopause is coming later. It was uh, generally better nutrition and uh, the care that we, health care right down the line for every illness and uh, that comes along, which things that would be fatal 100 years ago are blown off as nothing today. Well, I, I thank you all. It's been a pleasure to uh, be with you again, and uh, everybody can have a good night. Hey.